To me, it's not. I'm not. I'm not a big. You know. Press, press is press is good, but mass media is, is, is also um, quite has been quite ineffective in bringing out a lot of truths in the, in the American media in the last number of years. The BBC is a good example of a publicly owned company that is one of the most reputable and respectable world news sources. You know that gives us. Real, not just truths, but enough of a background and given the history to be able to make the decision ourselves, not just 30 second reels from an administration, you know, a face talking at you. We don't want to be talked at anymore as citizens in this country. We want to talk. We want to be talked to and with. You know, and um, so I enjoy doing press because, you know, it's, it's, it's how to get the word out about important things. But at the same time, I'm not, in, I'm not I don't enjoy doing, you know, a lot of press and getting the major TV stuff going a lot because I just want to get the word out. <laughs> I hear you there. You know. So, all right. Well, thanks a lot. Thank Good you, man. You. Thanks a lot. Likewise. Thank you. 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 We guess his age, we don't know his real age, but we just guess based on his stories and when he was young and, and you know, how old we think he is, but, but we, he's definitely in his 90s, we don't know his exact age because there are no documents existing from that time that we can trace, you know, birth certificates or because they were displaced and, so, I mean, they themselves were displaced out of their homes. Um, his, his father and uncles were killed, and his mother and uh, siblings were sent into, you know, into pogroms, basically. And so there's no documents. Um, I've been working with some friends and trying to dig up a deed to where he lived. I don't even know exactly, exactly what house he lived in, you know, but we're trying to research that because it's just interesting to know where, you know, this man came from. He's in Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. And what are some of the things that you've heard the whole story? Um, I actually had an organization come out a number of years back that basically documented survivor stories you know, of Holocaust and genocide. And while they were interviewing him, I just stayed out of it and just ran my own video camera for like six hours, you know, two sessions. And I put it on DVD for the rest of the family to have and to own, etc. And I, I heard some of, I heard things that I would never, I could never possibly do in my imagination in my dreams. Um, stories about, you know, he, he watched his brother be killed in front of his eyes, you know. Um, his brother was a sibling, a baby, and the baby was thrown on uh, the horns of an animal and killed. Um, he's, he's tried to commit suicide when he was about 10 years old. He was in a Greek orphanage because he just couldn't live with his dreams, his, his nightmares. Um, and um, I guess he felt alone, you know. So, um, he's just had a really, really tough life, obviously. And um, to me, his, his legacy and, and one of his wishes in life as he's close to death is um, the respect that not just the victims, but the victims that perished, but the survivors that remain um, of the genocide deserve from international recognition of this terrible event. And obviously, you know, if we haven't accepted the past, then we're likely to repeat it obviously in the future. We are repeating it right now. Darfur. Yep. Um, you know, there's. That's what it is. I mean, I'm really tired of politicized events. I'm really tired of economics and um, and politics being the reason for nations doing things. You know, earlier and you know, even even during World War One. Um, or, or earlier in the last century, there's, there was a lot of humanitarian causes. There was a lot of um, reasons that are. There was a lot of cases where foreign policy meant actually helping people. That's changed, you know, and that's sad to see. Um, I think oil companies, multinational corporations have enough money to take care of themselves. They don't need our congressmen as much as we do. They don't need our CIA as much as we do. They
they don't need our administration as much as we do, but yet they have the ear of these major people more than we do, and that's not fair, you know. Um, it's okay. How many songs Not many. Um, one from our first uh, debut record, um, ten, you know, eight, ten years ago, and one, one that, that that's coming out on the new record, the Hitchhikes, actually. But um, it's not about, you know, singing about genocide. It's not about. You know, I don't. I don't feel like you have to necessarily always present the same issue over and over again in music for that issue to be prevalent in your life and in your work. <laughs> responsibility as you do as a journalist, as a plumber does as a plumber, as a photographer does, you know, as a photographer, and we all have the same responsibilities, yet we all don't have any extra responsibilities to, to talk about these things. Um, I do have to say, though, that artists, just to finish my statement, artists are a little more acute and sensitive to things that are going on in the world, number one, because we travel often and we, you know, we're, we get to ex experience a lot of cultures, and also because if we're truly doing our job right, then we're skilled presenters of something beyond us, of a truth, of a poetry, per se, of our times, a reflection of our times. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Hey, Sam. Oh, okay. Hey, how are you? Let me just have some of the water I'm going to dry. I see B tape there, the B tape <laughs> for Horizon. Is it the water camera? You want me to ask the question? Yeah, but she was here. Sorry? No, no, no. Go ahead. As everybody knows, you're uh, towards the end of the month. It must be a very hectic tour. Yet, on, on, on uh, taking the time to come down here, uh, it must be very important issue. Can you tell us what it is? Why it's such an important issue? Uh, uh, well, we found out about the House uh, International Relations Committee, you know, overwhelming the passing of the two genocide resolutions, and, you know, figured out that it's back to Hester's hands to bring it up to the House, and we know, you know, in the year 2000, and we, 2004, he had the opportunity to bring it up, and you know, in the year 2000, it was the Clinton letter um, that basically that he used as, as a statement for, for not, you know, bringing the vote to the House floor. In 2004, I don't know what the deal was, but this is the third time, and we happened to be in the Chicago, Greater Chicago area, doing our tour cycle from the Midwest, and and you know, I just it, it, it was something that just in my heart motivated me, and, and I said. I gotta go, I gotta get him a letter, and, and I visited my grandfather before leaving, uh, you know, before leaving L.A. to embark on the second leg of this tour, and, and I was like, I gotta go there. Serge, most of us uh, in the audience knows that this is obviously an important issue to you because of your uh, heritage, but uh, you mentioned a couple of times now that it was important for your grandfather because you had made some of the work that you watched that in your interviews. Could you share a little bit more with our audience uh, with, uh, what that's all about? I think uh, survivors of genocide that, I mean, the, you know, I've seen old grandfathers and grandmothers um, have need a certain, um, it's not just the victims that have, that have died and perished in, in the genocide that, that have been uh, wronged, it's, it's also the survivors that have been wronged, and for, for a democracy that prides itself on, on, on freedom and the Bill of Rights not to accept uh, you know, officially uh, a crime against humanity, the first genocide of the 20th century is really hypocritical. Um, and, um, you know, before before I left town, I was talking to my grandfather, and, and he's, you know, he's, he's in his 90s, and, and he's not going to be with us much longer, and we all know that. 